I've heard that uh, Operation Ares was cut quite a bit before oh, yeah. it was published. Is that true? Oh, yes. It was cut heavily. It was originally something like 100,000 words, and it was cut to about 75,000. Uh, it needed cutting. I don't mean to, to yeah. say that it did not. Uh, but what happened, I wanted to show you this. Since you had seen the earlier one. Oh, that's <laughs> neat. <laughs> that's neat. For Gene okay. Wolfe, who turned into a very tall tree. That's neat. Um, I noticed in that, I don't, I, this is, uh, wish I, uh, I noticed right away in that book that you, you know, you have John Castle, there's a, there's a sort of chess reference, and you, that's something that's obvious, are you a chess player, is that something oh, you're yeah. Yes, um, and in fact, I just got Newton through doing this silly chess story, Choice of the Black Goddess. Uh, it's about some, some silly people who find a deserted temple on a jungle island, and they go in, and inside the temple, you, the floor is a chessboard, and the black queen is there, and that's the only piece on the board, hmm. and it goes off from there, but I've played chess since I was little. Yeah. Um... I'd like to ask you a couple of specific questions about the, the fifth. Oh, there we go, right there. Uh, a couple of specific questions about the fifth head of uh, Cerberus. Uh, first off, maybe you could talk a little bit about how that book evolved. Uh, were you aware early on that you were going to write three interrelated uh, pieces? No. no, not at all. I wrote the original story, the title story, the fifth head of Cerberus. Yeah. Uh, as a story for Damon Knight's Orbit, which is, in fact, is where it appeared. And uh, I went to the Milford Conference that year, and that was my conference story as well. And uh, when Damon was running the Milford Conference, I think he was running it at least half because he was editing Orbit, and he got the first look at all this yeah. stuff. And if he liked it, then he could go up to whoever had written it and say, I want to buy this for my phone. And, of course, that was what I was hoping would happen with the story, and what, in fact, did happen by the time I went to the Milford Conference mm -hmm. about to start. Uh, but I went to the Milford Conference, and Norbert Slepian was there. And at that time, Scribner's had a science fiction line, and Norbert Slepian was their editor. And he liked the story, and said, uh, if you could write two other stories of roughly the same length, uh, we'll publish them as a book. And I said, okay, you know, I'm, I'm willing to try that. And he said, all right, you write one of the other stories, and if it's good, then I'll be able to give you a contract. I'll have enough that uh, yeah. Scribner's won't get on my back if I issue a contract. Uh, so I did, and I wrote uh, oh, the story about Sam Walker. The, uh, the, a, a story by John, John Marsh. John V. Marsh, yes. And so that was the second one that you did write? Yes. And I said, that just left you. And uh, he said, you know, looks good, and he should name a book contract, uh, which was, even today, that would be really great. I mean, yeah. the was a good yeah. house. And yeah, it was a hard definitely. Uh, uh, at, at what point did you, uh, when you wrote the second story, uh, at this point, were you, were you already aware that the third one would also be interconnected then? Well, the idea was that the, they the had third to be interconnected. one would oh. be interconnected. Oh, I see. Um, that was something that Slepian and I had hashed out while we were sitting around in the living room. Um, it's interesting. The, the, I, I suspected that that was true, although, you know, when I went through it, the, the book this most recent time, it, 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 it really seemed like a novel to me, uh, the three pieces. Uh, it, it, it seemed like a little bit like a Faulkner novel, where you read the second section and now you're, you're understanding the opening section a little bit more. By the third section, things are starting to become clearer. Um, a couple of questions, specific questions about this. Uh, the second piece, the Sandwalker piece, I, I was very interested that you, um, it's, where did you come up with, or, it's called A Story by John Marsh. Mm -hmm. what, what gave you the idea to make the second piece a story rather than just a, a, a straight narrative in a sense? Do you know what I mean? Well, in other well, words? Because uh, the time of the 
of the book. Mm -hmm. At the time of the book, this period in the planet's history was way in the past. Right. And uh, I didn't feel as free just jumping back there as if it still existed. As I did saying, here is a legend uh, that has uh, survived mm -hmm. from this period. Mm -hmm. That's about all I can say. I yeah. wanted to show you Gardner as well. Oh, I, oh. I went and grabbed it. Oh, wow, you're right. <laughs> this is the uh, the quintessential hippie. And an orangutan, too. <laughs> I see what you mean. He, the hair and the beard used to be much, much longer. And they, in those days, the hair and the beard I can see why people were afraid. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, the opening sentence of The Fifth Head of Cerebus e echoes Proust, and you make the settings one of the, I think, real interesting things. That, uh, this place called Frenchman's Landing with all these French words and French references. Were, were, why were, was there a specific thing about the business with France? Was that just to create a kind of exotic exoticism? I know Poe used to set things in Europe or whatever to make it exotic. What 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 did you have in mind there with that? No, it was just that practically every science fiction story assumes that the people who go to the stars and set up a colony there, etc., are going to be American. It struck me that that was not necessarily true. Uh, there is somebody did a book, was it Brunner, that opens with the, the uh, sentence, the, the captain bore the good terrestrial name of Chad. And, uh, you know, he will. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. There are going to be a lot of chains out there, mm -hmm. and uh, it seemed to me that it's always seemed to me that it's uh, rather parochial to assume that everybody, uh, whoever gets into space, is going to be American. And I, I modeled the city essentially on New Orleans, uh, which of course was originally mm -hmm. a French city mm -hmm. and went to English speaking as, as a result of uh, what uh, the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, and I, as growing up in Houston, I had spent a good deal of time in New Orleans. New Orleans was a mm -hmm. reasonably close, large city that wasn't Houston. Yeah. You could go to. Yeah. Uh, when you, I guess it, it would be natural to do this, but uh, I was interested in the sequence of the three stories, the way they they interrelate. Like the second story, of course, in, in time is is much in the past. Uh, but now I think this is clearer to me too because that was the second one that you wrote. I, I, I was wondering if you ever gave any thought to moving that story to the, to the, you know, to the chronologically to the first, except it probably wouldn't make sense then, I suppose. It, it did seem to me that it would. Uh, I don't know how much thought I gave to it, but it seemed to me that to the order in mm -hmm. which I put them in the book uh, was the order that would make some kind of sense to them. Uh, we didn't. I didn't want to show what Marsh Marsh had been researching uh, before I showed Marsh the researcher. Right. And then, of course, I finished up with Marsh's story in VRT, which I'm the only one that likes that one best. It's like uh, that's Tommy my, Smothers, right? That's my. That's that was. I, I was. I was really. Uh, you really drew me into that. Uh, I began to, you know, the, the ambiguity about the narrator. You begin, to, and I, I, I think it's really, it's, I think I like it even more than the first piece in there, which is I told you the first piece I read by you. I think it's brilliant. There, there are a number of clues as to who the narrator is. Uh, Early on, see, I went back and reread it, and I began to note that there are some clues. For example, VRT and the narrator are both very poor shots, uh, whereas Marsh is a very good shot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was almost a something out of a Philip K. Dick novel, I thought, uh, practically. That uh, I guess it's not specifically Philip K. Dick, but as you begin to realize that uh, that the, 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 the person that is talking is not the person that you that, you know you assume it is, mm -hmm. uh, and that the whole reality of that race, that, that, that ability to mimic. Yeah. You know, well, if you hire a shape changer as a guy, there's a definite danger he's going to change in your shape, which in this case is what he did. There's a terrible typo in that book, by the way, where I think I've got a mule staggering under five pounds of meat. 
and the word hundred was left out in the <laughs> <coughs> by the type show. That's pretty funny. Um, I wanted to maybe have you talk a little bit about your writing routine. Uh, this, there may not be any kind of consistency to this, but when you when you find yourself starting a, a work, whether or not it's a novel or a story, do you find them beginning uh, in, in a similar kind of process? And if so, in other words, do you, do you tend to start with an idea or a character uh, or a metaphor or a, a plot idea? How, how does the work start, start with all you? of them? Uh, this is something I've been asked a lot, and I always give the same answer, which is when you're getting here, because it's the only true answer that I've got. I've got a bunch of stuff knocking around in my head. And I, I read something, or I see something, or I dream something, and I say, gee, that would, that's nice, it would be interesting in a story. And then at some later time, I think of a person, perhaps, and I think, gee, that's fine. And at some point, I say, I could do all this. I could take that man, and that woman, and that ship, and that situation, and I can put them all together. And that's when I write the story. In, in a sense, do you know, uh, when, when you begin the story, it sounds like you almost know where it's heading then. Oh, yeah, ways. absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I do, except that sometimes I have some terrible time getting there. Uh, when you read Castle of the Otter, you'll learn that I, I started the Book of the New Sun as a novel or a novella. Uh -huh. And uh, what it was was that I knew about where I was going. But when I started trying to get there, I discovered that there was so much more between here and here than I had realized. But I think I always know where I'm tending toward. Mm -hmm. I, I have a, at least a vague idea of how this thing is going to, to wrap up. And I wouldn't start it unless I did. Huh, so you know when you start the piece basically where it's heading then. Basically, I think like just I now you later. said, uh, just now you said yeah. that uh, the book of the new sun, you you knew where you were heading. Where where was that? I mean, what, what, no, but what was it? What was that idea then? Where, what, what was it? Remember the British Well Basically Club. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wanted Severian to be banished and then to return to the guild in a position of such authority that the guild would be forced to make him a master of the guild. And I wanted him to have to confront uh, the problem of Thecla and the problem of torture. Uh, it's, it's very easy to be like the people who condemn Ellison for hitting Charles Platt and say, oh, Violet, how terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very easy to say, gosh, how terrible to uh, beat a man with a whip or to lock him up for 30 years of his life or to uh, execute him. Uh, these are awful things, but when you were actually in authority, you find out that you've got to do something. Uh, yeah, Severian makes I know makes the point that without killing some of these people, they would be out killing people. That's that's right. Uh, you know, if you you take somebody like John Wayne Gacy, uh, do you know about John sure. Wayne? John Wayne Gacy lived like eight miles from where you're sitting right wow. now. Uh, what are you going to do with this man? If you're not going to lock him up uh, for life, what are you going to do? Because if you let him out, he's going to kill another two dozen places. So did you know then, you knew early on, I mean, I think one of the boldest things in the book, I thought, was making uh, Severian, of course, a torturer, and yet being able to um, make Severian... Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry to. Oh. I, right, right. It always seems to happen that way. I've, I've interviewed people with, you know, their horse, their mm -hmm. 
Well, at any rate, though, uh, we were we were talking about Severian's uh, his essentially his profession, and yeah. I, I thought that was, of course, one of the most. Did you know in the beginning? Then was that one of the initial ideas? Oh, yes, was that he yes. would be a torturer? Uh, one of the ideas, one of these initial things that came in, and I, I talk about this in Castle of the Otter, but I realize you want yeah. to get your interview too. I was at a Wendy Con. This would be probably '74, and the guest of honor was Bob Tucker. And Bob felt obliged for some reason to go to a panel discussion on costuming. And he wanted somebody to talk to him. I sat in the audience, and he asked if I would come with him, so I said, sure. Because I would not ordinarily have attended. I'm not a costumer. This is yeah. not my bag. And so I went, and I heard Sandra Measle and uh, several other people who were costumers set up and talk about how you do costumes. Uh, you know, how do, how do you do a, a brocade cloak, and how do you decide what to do, and is it a good idea to use fire as part of your presentation, which, of course, it's terrible, I think, uh, and that sort of thing. And as I sat there, I started sulking, because no one had ever done one of my characters as a masquerade costume. And I thought, well, gee, I've done a lot of stuff that they could do as masquerade costumes, and I started trying to think of what those things were, and I realized that there were very few, if any. Uh, a few, maybe, but not very many mm -hmm. characters I'd ever done who would fit in with the kind of thing that Sandra and the other people up there were saying. And so I thought, well, I'll think of a character that could. And I thought of this torture. A bare chest, everybody's got a chest. All you have to do is, is take your shirt off. And uh, black trousers, black boots, you can get anywhere. Black cloak with a hood and a sword, and here's an ideal, easy uh, science fiction masquerade costume. And so that stuck in my head. Uh, I had this this man who was this torturer. What was I going to do with him? And other things came together. One of them was a book that I read on body snatching. Uh, the people that used to... Uh, dig up uh, corpses and sell them to the University of Edinburgh hmm. for the medical students to dissect. So that opening image, that opening scene, yeah, the shot of the right. torture. That was one of the, the, the things. And uh, eventually I got this stuff, I got the, the thing that we talked about earlier about wanting to do the young man being drawn into the war. Mm -hmm. And I thought I can, I can put all these together. Uh, the young man can witness this body snatching scene that I'm now itching to write. The young man can be the guy who is, the torturer can be the guy who's pulled into the war. And so so uh, hmm. there's a wonderful uh, Peanuts cartoon where Snoopy is riding on top of the doghouse. And uh, he writes something like, uh, A frigate appeared up on the horizon. The king's extravagances were bankrupting the people. A shot rang out. Uh, the, the dulcet voice of a guitar sounded at the window, and he turns to the reader and says, the last chapter I'm going to pull this all together. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's like that. You, you get all this stuff, and you say, gee, I can pull all this together in the last chapter. Um, I want to ask you some more questions specifically about the Book of the New Sun, the, you know, the kind of organization that you had for it. But uh, generally, not just with that one, but um, with, with, with most of your works, um, do you find yourself, um, I, I assume, based on the, the sort of care that your prose obviously exhibits, that you, you must do a lot of rewrites? Or is that is this true? Is this some, one of the parts that's part of... I do a minimum of three rewrites. Or, pardon me, I do a minimum of three rights. Okay. Uh, an original and two rewrites. A lot of stuff uh, goes through four writings. And some of it goes through anything that you want to name up to say. 15 or something like that. What kinds of things do you find uh, yourself focusing on when you're uh, rewriting? I don't know if that's a if that's too general. Oh, it, it, yeah, it varies so much. Uh, a lot of it is uh, character, particularly in novels. Uh, it's always a problem for me when I have a character who shows up on page 10 and shows up again on page 300. 
to make sure that he's the same person on 300 that he was on 10. Mm -hmm. Of course, sometimes I like the man on 300 better than the man on 10, so I go back and I re rewrite page 10 to match the man that's on page 300. Uh, that is typical. Uh, just plain atmosphere is uh, a lot of it. Uh, I don't think I would have this much trouble now, but when I started writing the Fifth of Cerberus, this story, uh, those opening pages that you compared to Proust, which was mm -hmm. extremely flattering, I, mean, uh, I wrote those probably eight or ten times because at that time I had to write them eight or ten times to get the flavor that I wanted onto the paper. And it wasn't, I remember particularly the business about the vine coming up and, and wreathing in the grill over the window, and uh, I couldn't get that. So that it seemed to me like it worked with less than seven or eight rewrites, whatever mm -hmm. it was. That I mm -hmm. Do you work ordinarily from uh, any kind of outline? I know you must have with uh, the Book of the New Sun. I mean, you must have had a fairly elaborate outline there. It wasn't, wasn't at all really? elaborate. Really? No, it was. It was very simple. Hmm. And usually, I, it's all mental. Um, because it seems. I mean, that book seems so ex elaborately constructed. Uh, well, the, the elaborate construction was there, but I never put it on paper. Huh. Uh, That's interesting. Now I, I just did this book, Free Live, not just did, but a while back I did a book called Free Live Free, uh, which has only been published in a limited edition. It's coming out in the fall uh, in a, uh, a trade hardcover edition. And on that one, a lot of the action takes place in an old brick house on a city street. And uh, what I had to do there was draw the floor plans of the house, two-story house, uh, because otherwise uh, I kept getting, fighting myself asking mm -hmm. questions like, uh, can you see from this room to that room? Uh, when uh, Ben Free is in his bedroom, can he hear Candy walking on the the steps uh, overhead. Yeah. Well, yeah, he can because Ben Free's bedroom is on the first floor and Candy's is directly overhead on the second floor. But I had to, to figure out where the bathrooms were and yeah. where the stairs were and all that. But that really wasn't an outline. That was a couple of floor plans. And also the neighborhood. Uh, what's the house on the right? What's the house on the left? This is a limited edition. I would like to give oh, it to you, but wow. I can't. Wow, beautiful, Gene. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll take down the... Uh, who's, who's publishing this? Mark Giesen is the publisher. The same guy who published uh, Castle of the Otter. And I think his address is probably in here. It will save you doing it all if it is. But I, I admit now that I'm looking for it, yeah, I don't I can, see I can it. get the... Uh, I see the addresses right here. Giesen. Mm -hmm. Box 806. Um, this, Gene, I, I, this this question sometimes I, I I just sometimes get some bizarre answers, and sometimes it's just a stupid question. But um, do you think, in your own mind, is is there any single aspect of of writing uh, that is character portrayal, the the, the style? Is there anything that, that you think really is your primary focus as you're writing? Sure. Yeah. I admit this is a hackneyed answer, but that's no, true. No, no, it's, it's, it's almost interesting. But, but that's, uh, that's the thing you're most interested that's in. That's the thing I'm most interested in. Uh, I'm only thinking if I can follow that up with anything. Um, I found, uh, especially like, for example, in the, the Book of the New Sun, one of the things that that book seemed to me to be very much dealing with, too, are... I have a more formal question, but uh, I was I was very interested in the way that um, some of the fantasy aspects of that book really seem to me to be ways of your talking about uh, inner uh, psychological uh, aspects. Uh, that is things of sort of primal. I'll give you an example. I'll just read this here. Uh, um, I, I, I put down here. I, I thought that. Uh, that you explore, among other things, in the Book of the New Sun, uh, the inner non-rational aspects of people that can't be dealt with in normal ways of writing through logic. 
uh, many of the scenes, I thought, uh, for example, Severian's encounter with the uh, man-apes, the Wellsian sort of almost man-apes in uh, The Claw, uh, or the uh, his encounter with the Alzabo, I can pronounce these correctly, uh, they seem almost like, like dreams in which the inner inner forces, psychological forces, are literalized in a sense. I, I, I'm just sort of rambling here, but uh, that, that seemed to be, in a way, connected sure. to character. Sure, I think that's true, because I, I think that the reason that they are dreams is that they are things that are contained within the human potential. Uh, if you're a human being, you realize that it's possible for you to uh, degenerate to being a beast, if you're really a human mm-hmm. being. Uh, the people who don't realize that are the people who have degenerated to the extent that they, they no longer have that amount of insight. And uh, the thing with the Elzebo is the thing that I think that we tend to fear a great deal uh, when we oh work for major corporations. Uh, that we will become just a cog in the Procter and Gamble company or whatever mm-hmm. it may be. And the thing that the reason that we're afraid of those things is that there really are things that really can happen. Uh, you can become so much of an organization man that you're really just a voice coming out of the mouth of the organization. And you can become a uh, you can go back to being an ape if that's what you really want to do. In the Tarzan books, every once in a while, Tarzan gets really sick of civilization and he wants to go back to being an ape. And when real people do that, they usually drink. You know, mm-hmm. they, they turn off the, the higher mm-hmm. brain centers and uh, they become very much uh, like the sort of thing that we might imagine at any rate that a Neanderthal man was like. I don't know how, mm-hmm. I may be slandering yeah. a Neanderthal man. But uh, people, you know, drink uh, or whatever, use drugs yeah. to get rid of the pain of being a human being, to back down the ladder. And there is a potential for backing down the ladder. Mm-hmm. Um, let me just think if, that's, if there's anything else I want to ask about about that. I, as as I said, I, I one of the thing, one of the other things I notice, uh, I know Severian talks about this repeatedly. Uh, clearly, he's aware of the difficulties of talking about what is going on inside him, uh, his, in his unconscious. Uh, that's one of the things that I that I that I find interesting in, in your, your books. You you've got a, on the one hand you're a very gifted stylist. On the other hand, you seem very aware of the, the limitations of words, of the difficulty of talking. Uh, is that one of the functions you have? All those many times in, in uh, uh, the book of the New Sun, Severian will come out and address the reader directly about the diff- he's in, you know his difficulty. And uh, I'm not making a question here, really, am I? Uh, you seem acutely aware, though, of the kind of uh, the, the, the sort of limits of language. I think anybody who tries to, to press against the limits of prose, if you're trying to, to write something that's different from the stuff that's been written previously, not the, you know, the mm-hmm. commercial yard goods, the, mm-hmm. the story about the, the yuppie girl who meets the yuppie boy and they go to the beach, uh, you become aware of that. Uh, you become aware of the uh, extent to which words govern our thinking and uh, the extent that we're manipulated by words and the extent to which words limit our thinking. Uh, Orwell did all this in 1984 a lot better than I've ever done it. Uh, he, He said essentially, let me control the language and I will control men's thoughts. The Japanese used to have thought police. Uh, the thought police would come around. You know about this? This is for real. No, I didn't know that. This is Japan in the 30s. The thought police would come around to you and say, uh, what do you think about our expedition in China? 
And if they didn't like the answer, you were under arrest. Hmm. Uh, what Orwell said is, let me control the language, and I will make the language so that you can't think about anything that you don't want to think about, mm -hmm. that I don't want you to think about. Mm -hmm. Now, that isn't wholly true. Uh, you know, one of the dumbest things in the comic strips is when Spider-Man falls off the building, and he looks down and he sees a flagpole, and he says, if I can just grab this thing, this is a thought balloon, if I can grab the flagpole, I'm all right. Nobody does that. If you're falling off the building, you don't put that in the words. Mm -hmm. You are thinking below the level of language. So there is that sub-level there. And, uh, well, as, as I was saying, too, uh, and I, I really already repeated it, but that's one of the things that I find interesting about your work in general, is that you are able to... Uh, a lot of your, your works, to me, this is, I guess, talking about this issue of character and your interest in character. I feel that your your characters ring true to me, and one of the one of the ways that I one of the things that's interesting is the way that you are able to present situations um, which exhibit aspects of character that I think are are very difficult to talk about in normal storylines. That is, that's one of the, the advantages perhaps you have in fantasy, telling stories with the using the fa fantasy or you know magical. Sure. You know, Sure, I can have the Elzebub come in through the front door of the cabin. You know, uh, no, I, I could do. I could put the cabin in the Rocky Mountains, mm -hmm. and I could have a spaceship land. The Elzebub get out of the spaceship and go through the doorway. I can still do that. But if I'm going to write not about what is possible, but about what happens every day, then mm -hmm. I can't have the Elzebub right. walk through the doorway of the cabin. Right. Um, maybe we could talk just a little bit more about uh, the book of the New Sun. The kind of uh, was that a book that you had to do a lot of research with? There's been a lot of comparisons with Spencer. Um, I, I've also seen uh, the book compared to uh, the sort of gothic fantasies of uh, was it Merwin Peck. Or something? Are you Peek, familiar? Peek. Yes. Uh, yeah. I love was Peek. this a book that I mean? Was this a book that you did a lot of research on while you were doing it? Were you were you reading like Spencer? Was that somebody like, for example, or Swift or something like that? No, I, I've read those authors, but I wasn't reading much. I, I, uh -huh. I've read Peek. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I wrote an essay on Peek one time. Like, huh. I was after me to find a copy of it, and I tore this place apart. I couldn't huh. find it. But uh, the research that I did was largely, as far as I can remember now, anyway, uh, on Byzantium and the Byzantine Empire. Hmm. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things that's really bothered me about reviews is how often I get medieval Europe. And uh, what I was, insofar as I was doing anything, and I wasn't doing anything all that exactly, mm -hmm. come on. Yeah. But as far as I, I was taking an actual historical period, I was taking Byzantium. And the similarities were simply uh, the chance similarities between Western Europe in the Middle Ages and the Byzantine Empire during the Middle Ages. The Byzantine Empire was, of course, a mm -hmm. evil thing. Mm -hmm. And my, uh, well, of course, I got into terrible trouble with the Acheans, uh, too. My Acheans were my equivalent of Turks. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're coming from North America. If you if you read the story, the mm -hmm. story is in, it's taking place in South America, mm -hmm. and the the invading Asians are North Americans. And what I had never fastened on was that nine tenths of the readers were going to look at that word and say, "Oh, these are Asians." Asians. That that was what happened with me uh, when, what, when I first uh, saw that. <laughs> The, the word means people without shadows, and uh, it's the word that was used in the classical world for people who lived near the equator, hmm. where the sun was mm -hmm. just dead overhead at noon. And uh, I thought it would be interesting and it would be right if these people didn't realize that these invaders... I don't mean the leaders. The, the leaders know what's going on, but the ordinary man in the street in this right. 
isn't really that conscious of the fact that there's another hemisphere and these people are coming down from the northern mm -hmm. hemisphere. And the furthest people that he's really heard anything about are the Asheans, the people who live at the equator. And of course, these people come through the equator on their way to fight against the Commonwealth, and mm -hmm. so he calls them Asheans. And uh, I have gotten accused of being an anti Asian racist, uh, which I am not. And I, I never even had Asians in mind mm -hmm. when I wrote the darn thing. Hmm. Well, that's typical of reviewers, <laughs> if I do say so. Well, you, you get some of the damnedest things in reviews. I don't mean that there aren't good ones. Yeah, are, yeah. But there are some that are so utterly wrong-headed that you you wonder what in the world they were, they were at. I got a review of Free Live Free, in which the man says it isn't until page 450 that we get the get any indication that this is a fantasy story, that there are any science fiction or fantasy elements. Now, on something like page six, a man in the second story of this two-story house, he looks across at another character in the book, and this character is referred to as the witch throughout the book, and she vanishes as he watches her. This is like on page six. On about page 60, she calls up a demon. And then I'm getting this stuff about page 450. And I think that this, the way this guy reviewed yeah. the book was to say, Every well, this is awful thick. I think I'll start about here. And I'll read that. Yeah. Well, that's, that's one of the problems, really. Uh, I think, I'm not kidding, generally in American literature, is the, 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 the lack of good reviewers. The, the thing that got me, frankly, I... Tend, I hope I've concealed it well, but I tend to be rather anti-academic. Mm -hmm. uh, I have some very good friends who are academics. Uh, Betty Hull, Fred Holmes, mm -hmm. is an academic. Tom Clarison, do you know Tom yeah, Clarison? Yeah. yeah, he's a good buddy of mine. I love him. But most of the academics I have met rub me the wrong yeah, way. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm going like this. And I read a book on Proust by a Proust scholar. This is a man who's built his career on Proust. Somewhere in the middle of the book, he says, it's never really explained why Swan marries Odette uh, after he has fallen out of love with her. Well, it is explained. He does it to legitimize, legitimatize, uh, oh, what's her name? Can you think of her name? Are you talking about, you're not talking about, uh, Swan and Odette's daughter. Yeah. Um, it's something like Georgia, oh, but it isn't Georgia. I was going to say, no. Well, uh, Gilbert. Okay, okay. Uh, he does it to legitimatize this illegitimate child that Odette has born in. And that's there explained you are. in the book. And this man has built his career on Proust. And he never read that. Wow. Well, so. Just to finish off this business with, uh, uh, well, I don't really have a question here. Uh, obviously, you, 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 this book owes a great deal, for example, to Greek mythology. That's something that's been a, a lifelong, apparently, interest of oh, yours. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was interesting the way that some of those, like the Pandora's box myth, myth uh, re recur. Uh, were you suggesting, in a way, I wanted, by the way, I'm just doing this off the top of my head, but I remember when I read that, wondering if you were implying that certain... Um, had that myth been handed down all those years, or was that simply a sort of universal human truth that is always going to have a myth similar to that? I think the latter. Um, but I also did things with, for example, did you pick up the thesis myth? Um, and where, where, where I... The story, uh, Tale of the Student and His Son. Yeah. Okay, I hadn't thought about that. No, I, I yeah, didn't. Yeah, well, that's thesis going to kill the monitor in the labyrinth. Yeah. And uh, you see, the, in time, the monitor has been confused uh, with the ship that fought the Merrimack in the American Civil War. And that's why the giant appears as a ship with a, a ship's head in hmm. there. And uh, That's thesis, an interesting leap there, that connection. 
Uh, thesis has been confused with the thesis that's written by a PhD candidate. And that's why the, the student, to create this person, he has to write his thesis, you see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as he writes it, the thesis becomes more and more uh, real until finally he is fleshed out. But I wanted to read you this. Okay. This is page 13. Okay. I'm still sore okay. about this to every year, as you can see. He had taken several steps from it before he realized the witch was standing on the further side, pardon me, on the farther side of the stairwell watching him. He grinned at her, though he could not see her facial expression in the dim light. I've got a key, Madam S. She gave it to me. I was going to wait for her, but it's getting too goddamn late. The witch said nothing. He could just make out the whites of her eyes and the darker darkness that was her hair. It would be better if you didn't mention it. Nicer, you know what I mean. Slowly the witch vanished. There was no shimmer, and her vanishing was not sudden like the bursting of a soap bubble, nor did she disperse like smoke or melt like frost ferns on a window pane. She was and was not, between the two moments, the knife edge of time when she was and was not. Now that's on page 13, 13. and this guy is telling me that there's no hint that anything finish. is happening until page 450. Um, I bet he read the book just the way you suggested. I'm he started it about... Uh, one of the things, uh, another of the aspects about uh, Severian that I, I thought you handled in a very interesting way, and it seemed to be one of your points, one of the things that's interesting about Severian is that he is the, the torturer, but he's also a man of, uh, of, of passion and love and so forth. Uh, one of the things you seem to be driving at there was that sort of multiplicity of selves that is in, in everybody, I, 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 I assume. I'm, I'm trying to show that... The the potential for good and evil is present in all people. That's why we're people. Uh, we look at somebody like, oh, death camp guards in Nazi Germany. And we think, thank God I'm not like that. People. Those guys are fiends in human form. Well, they were. Mm -hmm. They were human beings who became pulled into a certain cultural attitude in which it was okay to be a death camp guard in that situation. And then everybody changed the rules. And that's what I want to show, because mm -hmm. until we realize that, uh, you know, we, we have, in the first place, we can't safeguard ourselves from that sort of thing. As long as we go around saying all the time, I am the guy in the white hat, I'm never going to do any ugly. And we can do any damn ugly thing. Mm -hmm. It's only when we realize that we're capable of doing those things that we can stop ourselves from doing them and that we have any right to condemn the person that did do them. Well, that seems to be... I'll just, that's funny that you said the next question. I, I said related to this is an idea that recurs throughout the book that good and evil, light and dark, uh, however you want to create a kind of metaphor for it, uh, imply each other. Sure. And are necessary parts of a of a, of a kind of process. In a have sense, have right? you read the Island of Doctor Death? Another yeah. story. Yeah. You know, at the end, Doctor Death tells Tacky, uh, "Well, Captain Ransom and I, we pull our little act again and again. You know, uh, because if you don't have Doctor Death, you can't have Captain. Death. Mm -hmm. You can't have the night unless you've got the dragon." It's kind of uh, like uh, you, you, you literally couldn't have the spend of the universe without positive and electric uh, charges, in a way. Pos positive, uh, positive and, and negative, negative charges. charges, sure. Uh, well, you can't have a positive charge unless there is a negative charge. If it's all positive mm -hmm. charge, then nothing's right. got a charge. Right. I don't know. Well, I think that's I think that's that's it's very important. Is that you know I think you're exactly right that that's the, the tendency of people is to deny. They say that evil is not a part of us, or whatever, however they want to define. And and yet, until we realize that, then we're, as you you were putting it before, we're we're lower. I mean, that that's one of those awarenesses that people have to make about themselves. Yeah, that this could be me. You know, the the man on the, the hackney thing is the man on the way to the scaffold, the murderer on the way to the scaffold. You have to look at it, and say that could have been me. And if you can't do that, then you've got no right to hang. Um, 
of, of course, the the whole, all four books, in a way, form a single book, in a way, a large book. But oh. as you were doing each of the individual books, were you, um, in a sense, um, interested in, 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 like, for example, was there was there any? Did, did you see as you were writing them? Did you did you feel about them all as a whole, or was there certain books that you felt well? I'm gonna I'm gonna be doing something formally, say, different in this one. Um, let me let me give an example. The second book I felt the claw. Uh, I think is that there. Yeah, it's the second. Book. My mind is kind of mushy here. Uh, that book especially seemed uh, maybe more than the others, but may, maybe not. But when I read it, it struck me with how how much you incorporated things like the the play within the book and stories and so forth. It was more. It was less direct, I felt, than the first book. I just wondered if any of that was sort of self-conscious. Like, I'm going to in this book, I'm going to be doing um, I, my aims are going to be different in a sense. Yeah, well, uh, that was true. Uh, my first book was going to be all the city of Nessus, and in my second book, I said, well, I'm going to at this point, I'm going to get outside of Nessus, and show the atmosphere, the surroundings. And when I want to show atmosphere and surroundings, I tend to show that sort of cultural stuff. Uh, what kind of clothes do people wear? What kind of stories do they tell? What kind of jokes would they make? Uh, there's a section, by the way, in uh, the Castle of the Otter there, in which I call on a lot of the stories, a lot of the characters from the Book of the New Sun and ask them each one to tell a joke. And so when you, you when I want to give that kind of atmosphere, uh, then you find me falling back on that sort of cultural thing. Mm -hmm. I would love to be able to do music, but I don't feel that I could do enough in trying to describe music with words. Now, maybe there was somebody else who could do it mm -hmm. and make it work. But I don't feel that I can to make that a very uh, a rich color for my palette. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish I could. Um, well, so in, in, in each one of them, then, obviously, uh, there was a specific, in other words, when you started it, you, you, you knew that this was the kind of area that you wanted to be uh, emphasizing. Sure. I saw, I saw the book falling into four distinct segments. Nessus, getting from Nessus to Prax, Prax, and the war. And you'll find they pretty much follow those. Right. There's, a, there's a certain amount of slop over. But it seemed to me I had those four things, basically, uh, that were going to be the main scenes. I, I noticed uh, that somewhere else you said uh, that Charles Dickens was a writer that you admired. And I felt that the description, in a kind of strange way, of Thrax, that whole opening uh, of, uh, that's the sort of Lictor, I guess. Uh, had a lot of kind of almost Dickensian uh, atmosphere there, I thought. That city, I thought you, you really brought it alive. It, it was like, for me, reading a story about 19th century London or something. Uh, very exotic. And, and, and sort of all, you had a lot of, of course, social satire, too. I mean, the well, it, it just seemed very real. Well, there, there was, uh, I don't know, satire may not be yeah. correct, right, but there was a lot of social comment. Yeah. It? Uh, because uh, everything had come to, to so much more of a smaller scale. Uh, Severian was now the person with whom the Archon had to deal, or I should say, had to with whom he naturally dealt when he was uh, concerned uh, with the vernacular, with the. Uh, uh, Essentially, his, his police and penal service. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas Nessus is so damn big that you can never see it all at once. That's the thing about Nessus, is that it's so damn big you mm -hmm. can never see it all at once. Uh, by the way, have you read a story of mine called The Map? No. 
Okay, if you ever want to get it, it is reprinted in that Gardner de Zouave book we were looking okay. at just a minute ago. There it is, right there. Mm. Uh, but that is also laid in Nessus. Uh, oh, that's interesting. You you were you remember Eda from the Shadow of the Torture? Yeah. Okay, Eda becomes as a middle aged man. He's the main character in the map. Oh, I heard that you were uh, working somewhere on, a, on a, another book about New Earth. Was that is that right? <coughs> <coughs> Oh, excuse me. Oh, sorry. There. This damn bronchitis or whatever. Yeah. God, it's... Well, sorry to... <sighs> torturing you here. Oh, like you're not torturing me. It's just that all of a sudden uh, yeah. I get this impulse yeah. that I can't suppress. Uh, okay, there's a book called The Earth of the New Sun. It's about halfway through Second Draft. It is in the safe there on the other oh. side of that chest of drawers. Not the one on the hassock, the one on yeah. the floor. What happened? Do you do you want to get all the business background on this? Sure. Okay. When I signed a contract for Citadel of the Otter, there was an option in that contract on the next on any on the next book in this series. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it And I got got. The reason that option was there was that I got a lot of pressure from David Hartwell, who at that time was the editor at Pocket Books, to do a fifth book. I had written the four books essentially as a piece. I, yeah, I wrote all four right. books in first draft, and then I went back and I did the, all the subsequent drafts. Oh, okay. the Shadow of the I was going to ask about that. Okay. And uh, But David Hartwell came and said, look, you, you, you've got to bring the new sun. You never did that. And uh, so I said, no, I, I, this is a story of Severian's ascent to the throne of the Commonwealth. And uh, that's the story I set out to tell. That's the story I told. This is how Severian became monarch. And he said, yeah, but all this stuff about bringing the new son is implied. So you got to do another book. So I said, okay, do, do another book. Started to do the book. Got it halfway through the second draft. And uh, while I was doing all this, say about the time that I was through the first draft, uh, the situation at Pocket Books got worse and worse and worse. David Hartwell was fired. Mm -hmm. Pocket Books went through all this crazy business where they were going to hire the Scott Meredith Literary Agency as a book package or an office. Mm -hmm. Pocket Books announced they were. Terminating science fiction, they were going to do nothing except, I think it was Star Trek books. They had to contract and do Star Trek books. So they had to continue with those. Everything else was out. Uh, some of the their contracts, or open contracts, were turned over to Bain Books, which was essentially created by Pocket as a way of having some place to turn them over to. Uh, some of the contracts were returned to the writers. I assumed from all this that I would not be held to my option. And it's the fifth book. I signed a contract with Tor Books for two books, Free Live Free and The Earth of the New Sun. When word got out around New York that I had signed this, my agent got a call from Pocket Books that said, we are going to take you to court. We have a valid option on this book. You have no right to hmm. sign a contract with another publisher. Four books said, okay, you know, we, we understand you're in a bind. We'll scratch out the earth of the new sun on this contract and write another novel yet to be named. Which is what they did. But I was then stuck with this two-book contract and a deadline for the second book. And I didn't have a second book. So I stopped work on the earth of the new sun. I started working on Soldier of the Mist, which is... I'm working on two novels mm -hmm. now. I've got Soldier of the Mist, which is in third draft. And I've got, uh, there are doors, which I'm, is in first draft. And you don't find it difficult working back and forth like that? No, I like to do that. I don't like to do all first draft all day, mm -hmm. or all uh, revision all day. I like to do some first draft and some revision. 
And uh, I don't find that difficult. What I find difficult is the other way, like if I were under enough deadline pressure, then I would have to stop on doors and I would have to do all mm -hmm. revisions. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. I don't want mm -hmm. to do all for sure. Mm -hmm. But anyway. Okay.